Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Who's your favorite Bible character? Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Springfield. This morning, our name tag question is, who is your favorite Bible character? And the request was that we opted out of the easier answer. Jesus, I know that some of you just can't get beyond that, and you have to make Jesus your favorite Bible character. I get that. He is my favorite as well. But second to him, I decided to list that my favorite Bible character today was Joshua. I love the way that Joshua faithfully lived his life fearing and courageously following the Lord, drawing people's attention back to the words of Scripture and to follow the Lord as they entered into a challenging environment. Others of you, I've seen a lot of Peter uh, on name tags. I've I've seen Joseph. Uh, Most of those, I think, have been Old Testament Joseph. Uh, I've seen Daniel. I've seen David. I don't know who your favorite Bible character is, but I hope that you have been thinking through and interacting with others. You're welcome to ask that question and ask a why afterwards. I think it's interesting to hear the why. I told somebody earlier, I said, I really like him, but I would not at all want to be Daniel. Not the guy I want to be. There's some other guys in the Bible I wouldn't want to be. I wouldn't want to be Ezekiel. Okay? I wouldn't want to be Isaiah. There's a lot of guys I wouldn't want to be in the Bible. A lot of ladies that had some difficult tasks and difficult environments but that can point us through their correct steps towards the Lord, and through their imperfections, they point us to a Savior who is the best character in the Bible. The Bible has one hero, and a lot of sub-heroes with heroic traits, but the one hero of Scripture is Jesus. And we gather and we worship him and we celebrate him, we sing songs to him while recognizing the good and the heroic characteristics of some of the other people in the Bible, but also their tragic flaws that point us to that Savior and offer us hope that those great heroic characters still have tragic flaws and sin that point us to the Savior. So we celebrate him and we seek to live for him. Let's rise now, stand, and sing. done 
You may be seated Father, on our time together today. Lord, um, our hearts are uh, concerned for uh, ministry, especially today we think of the ministry to our Hispanic brothers and sisters uh, all around the world. Thank you so much, Father, for those who serve you, those who are you have called to, um, to lift up your name among our Hispanic brothers and sisters. Uh, Lord Jesus, I know that, that there are many from uh, various uh, South American countries who are missionaries in other countries as well. Thank you for putting that burden on their heart. Lord, uh, we pray, uh, I would pray especially today for those uh, brothers and sisters who are in our country. Lord, we, we, um, we, we just don't know how to respond sometimes. The, uh, the need seems so great. And there are those here among us, Lord, who are hurting in so many ways. And uh, it doesn't really matter, Lord, uh, what it is that we think of the political debates or how we try to decide that issue. What is important, Father, is these brothers and sisters are, are creatures created in your sight whom you love. And we ask God for uh, those who would stand in the gap and lift up the name of Jesus that you might draw to yourself all those who are hurting, all those who need you, Lord. We just thank you so much for, uh, for what you've done for us. And we ask, Lord, that in turn, we would be loving and kind and gentle and gracious to all that you put in our path. Lord, um, we know that, uh, that the ministry uh, to our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters takes place in so many different places. Um, some of us, uh, you know, are close to our heart. Uh, it, Karen, they're serving in Spain and uh, others serving so many different places. God, we just ask today that your presence would be with them that you would empower them by your Holy Spirit and that you would find, put them near the people who, uh, who are closest to receiving you as their personal savior. Lord Jesus, thank you for all that you do uh, among us and the, and the work that is done through our giving, through our prayer, through our support of those who serve you actively and full time. Lord, you see other needs that exist in our church you know each one and father it is our privilege today to lay those needs before you and to know that you are capable and willing and loving toward each that you have made and you know how to meet those needs today may your people sense your presence and sense your power in a new and fresh way and may they be encouraged lord to stand up for you and to honor you in all they do and for all that you do, Father, in our time together today, we'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ron. Let's give it another shot on the, uh, the video here. Mis padres son de México. Hola, me llamo Ruiz Salinas. Mis padres son de México. Y yo nací en Misión, Texas. Y yo estoy aquí en Europa en una misión con el IMB, estoy aquí por todo el verano y las experiencias aquí es, son muy bonitas. La gente de aquí es muy buena, muy humilde, siempre esperando para ayudar. Yo les diría a ustedes, si una cosa, vayan. Si tienen esa curiosidad de ir en misiones, por favor, háganlo. Déjenlo todo porque Dios lo vale. Él lo merece, merece tu vida. Así que con nuestra vida lo deberemos de glorificar. Y si tienen esa curiosidad, ese llamado para decirles a todos del evangelio, por favor, háganlo. Él, él es suficiente, Él es proveedor. Si Él te está abriendo esas puertas, por favor, háganlo. Y igualmente es tan importante también estar orando por los misioneros que están aquí, por el trabajo que están haciendo. Y si ustedes conocen a alguien que son misioneros, misioneros, si están pensando en hacer también misioneros, por favor, oren por ellos, que la tierra sea deseable, sea más fácil, se, se plante la semilla. Sigan orando por ellos y orando por ese deseo para las demás de las naciones, porque ellos también necesitan que oír de, del amor de Dios y del evangelio. Aquí bastante gente necesita de eso. favorite line in that is um, she proclaims that Ruby proclaims that uh, as we lay down our lives
for God and the gospel because he is worth it. Um, I think today as we come together as one people, both divided by culture, but not divided by our common savior, um, not only can we lay down our lives for him, but we can also lay our lives before him and before each other. So I invite you to stand. Let's sing together the great forgiveness of Christ and what intimacy that can drive us towards. We don't have to put up barriers between each other. We don't have to be uh, falsely righteous before each other because we have a true righteousness found in our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. <laughs> take the blame but forget we're free at last we avoid your sons and daughters for the fear we don't belong give us eyes to see each other song, uh, my personal prayer. I hope it uh, could be true of you. Uh, I'd ask uh, by the time the second chorus rolls around, give it a shot and try to sing it with us. say 
all the treasures that lie in my storehouse. They cannot enter when I enter your church. I'm Daniel Aarons. I'm serving as Deacon of the Week. A uh, pastor has asked the deacons to continue to share a short testimony about the faithfulness of God in our lives. And as I was reflecting back on that this week, I hope like many of you, I can see God's faithfulness in providing both physically and spiritually for my family all our days. We always had shelter, food, all the supplies we needed and we had a loving and supportive environment to grow in. In times of illness, uh, God provided strength and comfort. My mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when I was a young teen, and my father was diagnosed with a different autoimmune disease a little later in his life. And he gave both my parents strength to endure the suffering um, that comes with those diseases, and he provided comfort to my family during the passing of my father, and then two years later, during the passing of my mother, uh, uplifting our hearts in, in our time of loss. For me personally, I know God has provided guidance and understanding in times of my life when I had doubts or had questions, and he was always faithful to bring me back to him. And as much as we should hope and expect for the faithfulness of God, we need to remember our faithfulness to him as Hebrews 11, 6 begins, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Please join me for our offertory prayer. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for all you have created 
all that you have provided for us. Please guide us to give of our talents, our time, and our resources to honor and glorify you. And take that which we give, multiply it to grow your kingdom here on earth. Thank you for sending the Son, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dan. And church, as you hear stories of God's faithfulness from others, if you want more to talk with them in any particular way, please grab them as our children are dismissed for Children's Church. Uh, but if you, they can be a further encouragement for you, or if our deacon of the week can be somebody to pray with you, encourage you either before or after the service, or throughout the week, their information is now listed there on the front cover of your bulletin if you want to get up with them during the week. Our staff is always available um, to talk or pray with you, and I hope you already know that, but that's another person throughout the week. If they can serve you by praying for you and encouraging you, you're welcome to get up with them, information listed in the bulletin. Some of you have really cool jobs, but do really intimidating things. Okay? Some of you probably either give or receive some version of a security briefing. I don't really get to participate in security briefings. I just get to watch them from time to time on TV. And maybe some of you later can come and confirm, Pastor, that's the way a security briefing actually works, the way it, you see it on TV, or no, that's not at all the way that it works, okay? But some of you are already giving me the thumbs up, like, hey, maybe, yeah, that's, that's somewhat, you can just imagine that. So for those of you that have never been in a security briefing, just imagine that it's the way that it goes on TV. For those of you that can't picture that, I'm going to try to paint a picture for you in a minute of a security briefing for our church. Now, we've got a security team. They're watching me right now on the cameras, watching the room. They're floating around the building, doing their best to pray for, to protect, and advise. And from time to time, they'll tell me something interesting that they see or they find or that there was a kid wandering the hallways or, you know, the, the biggest and worst mischief that happens around here typically during the service. I, I hear about it every now and then, but I'm thankful for their ongoing work, but I don't mean a physical security threat. Okay, I want to imagine that we're all sitting in the room. So if you need to close your eyes and imagine this for a minute, you can close your eyes and imagine it. And, and a messenger begins giving the security threat to us, and particularly to me as pastor. Pastor, there's a threat to our church. There's a threat from culture. In fact, it's a multifaceted threat, pastor. There's never been less it's never been less popular, less culturally acceptable in America to be a Bible-believing Christian. Pastor, we've experienced in the past great freedom, great privileges, even favor in the eyes of the government. But our cultural influences from the past are waning. There's a threat. Pastor, there are many who oppose our views, who would even oppose whether there's truly right and wrong who've begun referring to love as only approving of a person's behavior, whether it is right and helpful or wrong and harmful. Pastor, there's a threat to churches in that world. Another messenger reports, Pastor, we've got a significant threat coming in from the political left who favor special interest groups, who call our views on sin hate speech. There's a growing threat, Pastor. We foresee a time coming when it would be very possible that Bible-believing Christians that hold orthodox positions that Christians have historically held, that doing so will cost churches in significant ways. There's a threat. It might lead to individual Christians already facing consequences in their workplace or effectively being canceled by cultural influencers. Pastor, there's a threat from that side of the political spectrum. Another messenger, Pastor, there's a threat from the political right, who also favor their special interest groups, who practice sinful, hateful speech and regularly use deception and lie in the pursuit of power. The selfish pursuit of power comes at the expense of people, and it's often associated with evangelicals. Pastor, that threat is real because at times evangelicals and culture, they've aligned themselves with the political right as if might makes right and the ends justify the means. In addition to that side of the threat, the evangelical church outside of this room, is, it's, being guilty of, it's being perceived as guilty by association even when they do distance themselves from either political spectrum. Another messenger, pastor, our country has never seemed as far from God. As blind 
to sin as now. We're not on threat level yellow or threat level orange. Pastor, this is our highest level threat in the history of our country to marriage, to family, and to the way in which Christians practice their faith. Pastor, the threats from outside are real. Pastor, in other countries... There is extreme persecution around the globe. There are more Christians being killed now every day than any time in history. Pastor, the threats are real and they're outside. The last messenger speaks and says, Pastor, I don't want to discount any of that. But the greatest danger to our church is not from the outside, it's the sin inside. Church, the greatest danger to us is from within. And it takes courage to deal with sin. We don't need to be as worried about the problems of the outside as the problem within. So in a very serious and a very real and a very, I hope and pray, personal way, I want to give you a security briefing on the danger within our own hearts in our church and churches like us. Yeah, I'm worried about the outside, but I'm terrified of the sin within. I think Paul was as well. If you've got your Bible, navigate to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's page 1148. Paul writes to the Corinthians. If this verse first, then we're going to peel back a few verses. But he writes to them about the danger within. But he writes to them about the beautiful promise promises of God he says since we have these promises beloved let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God having these promises beloved let us bring holiness to completion in the fear of God Oh, that God would give us people that hate nothing but sin and fear nothing but God. Courageous men and women. Let's look back at the promises starting in verse 14. The promises here in 2 Corinthians to the church and to us as well. Some words of warning. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial, or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we, we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God. Notice the beautiful promises here. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. Be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will welcome you. I will be to you a father, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Today, my goal is to put courage into you to purify yourself from sin by counting upon the purifying and cleansing of God. To put to death sin by counting on the purifying promises of God. To say no to sin. Because the greatest danger to our church is from within. Boys and girls in box one, draw a church building. Just draw it, kind of the outline of it. And then I want you to draw a whole bunch of ugly stuff on the inside that represents sin. Darkness, whatever you want to draw that represents sin on the inside. 
the greatest danger to our church and the evangelical church is sin within. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 tells us having these promises were to bring holiness to completion in the fear of God. So what are the promises? And let's walk through the text because the text informs the way we should live. Verse 14 says, Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Okay? Now, what does this mean? This is a verse I've heard since I was a little kid and kept in mind. What does it mean to be yoked? Is that like having two eggs thrown at you or what's going on with that? Okay. Some of you are like egg, yolk, okay, egg yolks. Okay, that's why I was going with this, that one. Right, what does it mean to be unequally yoked? All right, some would say, and the earliest bra- version of my brain that heard this was that it means that you shouldn't be married to non Christians. Christians shouldn't be married to non Christians. But the original idea is of working together in the field with different animals that work differently. This has been applied to marriage, and I do think it should apply to marriage. If you're a believer, You should choose to marry a believer, okay? Believers should have God as their primary focus in life and as the foundation of life, and non-believers don't have that foundation. People with different foundations and things that are of first importance in life will struggle to work together in marriage. By the way, this has implications for our teenagers as well, young men. If she doesn't love Jesus and obey him, then she should be off your radar, And same thing, young ladies, don't date someone so that hopefully they'll become a Christian. It's not a good strategy for you or for them. But what if you're already married to a non-believer? What does this text tell you? What's the Bible tell you? Because that's many of you in this room. Should you divorce them? No. Paul's already dealt with this, actually, in 1 Corinthians we're at 2 Corinthians, which came after 1 Corinthians, okay? So in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says to remain in that marriage whenever possible. And what if after marriage you became a believer, but they haven't? Same thing. Stay in your marriage. Represent the Lord. Love your spouse and pray for them. So don't be unequally yoked doesn't mean you got to get out of it if you got into it. doesn't matter how you got into it whether it was through you not walking with Jesus as you should have and making a decision that was resulting in you marrying a non-believer when you were a believer, or whether neither of you were and one of you has become a believer. Pray for your spouse. Love them. Serve them. Point them to Jesus. This is not condemning you for that. But do not, if you're not married, don't try to establish the most pivotal of life's relationships with someone that does not share your foundation. And that has great implications for our teenagers and for our singles. Let's pray for those in our church who are in a marriage where the husband or the wife does not believe. Let's support them. Let's encourage them. Let's be men and women of faith to point their children to them, to the Lord. Let's have, pray for them to have patience and gentleness in their marriage when conflicts arise due to differing priorities. Now, does this passage then mean if it's not about marriage, what does it mean about business? Should you have business partners? Should you and one other person go into a partnership together if if they're a non-believer and you're a believer? Maybe, maybe not. It could. It, It does matter how you operate your business if Jesus is in first place in your life and his commands are your priority and they're not somebody else's. But but this doesn't disclude or exclude that. Does this mean as Christians, some have suggested that we should be unequally yoked when we frequent restaurants or buy from businesses or go to theme parks that don't honor Jesus. That we should only support Christian businesses and run in Christian circles and buy Christian t-shirts and eat Christian mints, okay? And breathe Christian air, I don't know, okay? This doesn't mean that you're never supposed to interact with people in the world. Paul does not list every possible situation that they should not be yoked to. He doesn't try to give them a thousand-point list. He gives them a principle, and he leaves it to the Holy Spirit's direction and wise counsel from others to how to do the specifics. But he's already told them in 1 Corinthians 5, which comes before 2 Corinthians, he's already told them that non-believers are going to act like non-believers to leave that to God, but instead to deal swiftly and significantly with the sin of, within 
These words from 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all, meaning the sexually immoral of this world. Or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since when, since then you would need to go out of this world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or an idolater or reviler, drunkler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outside? It is not those... It, is it not those inside the church whom you are judge? God judges those outside, so purge the evil person from within. Paul's problem with the Corinthian church was not the pagan Corinthian culture, which was way worse than our culture. Paul's problem with the Corinthian church was the sin within. Our problem is not with the pagan culture. Our biggest security threat is from within. So this warning about being unequally yoked doesn't mean not to do business with, doesn't mean to not support non-Christian businesses. It tells us carefully to consider the sin within the church and make sure that we, those attending the local assembly of a church are actually believers walking with Jesus. The greatest danger is from within. We get to the latter half of verse 14. We see a series of questions designed as rhetorical questions, really, to make us see the serious danger, the incompatibility of sin and their identity as the redeemed people of God. I want to show you the promise and the beauty of God's provision and what he will do, but I also want to show you these questions and walk through them. The big point from all of these questions from verses 14 through the 16 is that they would behave in God's world according to their identity in Christ and the power of the Spirit. That they would behave in God's world consistent with their identity and who they are in Jesus according to the power of the Holy Spirit. They don't need to do all of this by their own power. They don't need to do things that are contrary to their truest, deepest identity. No, they need to function according to their Christ-given identity by the power of God's Spirit at work in them, and so do we. He says in verse 14, What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just a uh, chapter and a half before, Paul writes that in Christ, our unlawlessness, our sins are gone. God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. In Christ, our identity is one who is righteous. We are given a righteous identity to live out by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that is not a lawless one. Function according to that identity in Christ, not the old identity. Verse 15, what fellowship does light have with darkness? They are opposites. All right, boys and girls in box two, draw something light. Then give me an equal sign. Then draw something dark and cross out that equal sign because light does not equal darkness. Light, one side, equal sign, darkness, and then cross out the equal sign because they do not, they are not the same. And Christ is the light of the world. And we are to reflect his light by being a light in the world by his power so that others would see our good deeds and glorify our God and Father in heaven, according to Matthew 5, 14 through 16. So we should grieve the sins committed that tarnish our light to the world. And we need to protect and cherish our little ones. It's one of the reasons why that we run background checks. We put two leaders in a room and we do all we can to protect those entrusted to our care because our sins from within tarnish not only our walk with God, but our light in the world. So we want to be as far from sin as we possibly can be because we want to fear nothing but God and hate nothing but sin. We need to function as the light that we are in Christ instead of walking in deeds of darkness. Verse 15, 
what relationship is there, what accord is Christ with Belial? How do those two get along? By the way, Belial there is a word representing Satan, meaning worthlessness or treachery. Satan, Christ, opposites again. Here we go. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If you are a believer, your identity is one belonging to the kingdom of the beloved son, not to Satan. Function according to your identity by the power of the Holy Spirit. The two are incompatible. The Christian is in Christ, not belonging, not reporting to Satan. Romans 6 presented the picture of slavery to sin. It's the old life, service to Christ in the new life. What master are you serving? Is it the one that is consistent with your identity? We need to see the contrast going on between the believer and the unbeliever. We don't inherit the same thing. We don't share the same values. Our belief or our faith is a gift of God empowered by the Spirit. As Philippians 1 tells us, that faith and belief are granted to us and it calls upon us to endure even suffering in Christ. Believers place their faith in Christ and according to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, just a chapter before, are new creations. If anyone, not some, if anyone, Anyone, which seems to mean anyone, means all believers. That means you if you've trusted Christ, not special Christians. You if you have trusted Christ as Savior. You are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We need to function according to our new identity as believers, as new creations in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, this is repetition, and repetition aids learning. You're not being asked to pursue holiness by your own power or contrary to your new nature. Verse 16. We are the temple of the living God, and it's the language of God, the temple of God, and idolatry being contrasted. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, we find Paul's remarks about individual believers being the temple of God. By the way, in 2 Corinthians, about the corporate church, but individual believers. And he says that as one's bought by the, Spirit's, by the Son's work on the cross and dwelt by the Spirit, he calls upon them in 1 Corinthians to avoid sexual immorality because you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body as the temples of God. And I am very certain that if Paul was writing to our church and the evangelical churches, much like ours, throughout the United States and around the globe, he would add these very same words, that the greatest danger is from within, and it is sin, then it could easily be said that the greatest specific issue that we need to address is sexual sin. Brothers and sisters, God cares about what you do with your body and what you put into your minds. You can look but don't touch is great advice for taking a kid into an expensive store with fragile stuff, but terrible advice for life. So be careful, little eyes, what you see, because our Father up above is looking down with love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Boys and girls, in box three, I want you to draw the word, write the word sin, S-I-N, sin, and then I want you to draw a person destroying it, okay? Okay? Boys and girls, I, I'm really intrigued by the way that you're going to destroy sin. I don't care if you draw bombs being dropped, if you draw somebody stomping on it, slashing it with a sword. I mean, just destroy sin on your paper. Destroy it. You figure out how to destroy it, but put it to death. Church, let's put lust to death. Jesus died for that. He's not created you In Christ for that, he's created you in Christ for righteousness and good works, not for lust. And whether young or old, men or women, lust enslaves. Don't tolerate it in your personal lives, whether or not you are married. 
Now, I know some of you think it's not possible to put lust to death. The only way to get past it is to give into it. But let me tell you a, another story. I want you to imagine for a minute, we're not going to go here for very long, but imagine for a minute that you're not married yet. You're in a place you probably shouldn't be doing things you shouldn't be doing with your significant other and your body's screaming at you. And in that moment, you may not feel like your passion can be controlled and that your only recourse is to satisfy your desire. And at that very moment, a guy bigger than Pastor Sam comes barreling into the room, turns on the lights and says, what are you doing with my daughter? At that point, your desires are still in control of your life. Your desire to live is in control of your life. Guys, why would you fear that dude and not that dude? Why is it that that picture puts fear in us, but Jesus doesn't? Let's bring holiness to its intended end out of fear of God. Now, I want you to see the promises here. Because God does not just leave them having beaten them over the head with what they should not do and how it's inconsistent with their biblical identity. Oh no. Remember God's promises and his presence help us walk in purity. We do not do this alone. I promise you, God's always watching. God is the one that knows your browsing history. He's more scary than the father in the story. church body if you're been acting you've been acting impure in this way and you're a guy come see me after the service i'd love to pray with you talk with you encourage you ladies if it's you come see my wife after the service or in the invitation she'll also be in the foyer and listen if you've had a spouse or someone else that's brought shame and dishonor in your life through their pursuits of these types of things Know that God's grace abounds, that hope abounds, and it is not your fault when someone else says yes to sin in this manner. Listen, church, if we're being real and being honest today, this room's full of people. Full of people that don't have a perfect record with lust. I was once young and foolish and didn't fear God as I should have. But by God's grace, I am not who I was, and by God's grace, I am who I am now. This room is full of people that have had past struggles and I'm certain that have present struggles. Let's deal with sin seriously. Let's hold each other in prayer, accountability, and helping each other pursue God and his purposes. It is God who forgives and pur purifies and washes us. Remember, it's God who does that. So the church ought to be the safest place for us to talk about our sin. Not Starbucks, not with non-believing friends. The church ought to be the safest place for us to deal with sin because it's in the church that we're surrounded by others that are forgiven and have been shown grace. So we need to remember as we deal with others and sin and our own sin that it is God that purifies, washes us, and helps us walk righteously according to our identity in Christ by the power of the Spirit. By the way, though, we are the temple of God as believers. In chapter 6, back in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he writes to them to avoid sexual immorality, writing unto them as the individual temples of God, as individual believers. Here in 2 Corinthians, he's referring to the church body as the temple of God, the corporate body. So when God looks on First Baptist Church of Springfield, he sees each and every one of you that are believers, but he also looks at us and he says, why are you, what are you doing as a church to treat sin seriously? Not legalistically, as if that's what earns you standing before God, but seriously, as if sin actually is offensive to God and destructive to us, because it is. 
If it's not lust, it's the crushing idol that destroys us. It's often covetousness, where we only want from God and ask God stuff that, for stuff. Where our greatest ambition in life is our possessions. And the reason our prayer life is, and we see that in our prayer life about getting more stuff. And we're happy when the economy is good. We give to God in the church when we're happy with life. And when the economy isn't great or we don't have our stuff, we hold on to it instead of giving to the Lord. If you're holding on to things that you ought to be giving back to God, you're punishing yourself as an act of disobedience and idolatry. Worshiping the possessions as if they bring you security and joy. Boys and girls in box four, I want you to draw some idols. I don't know what idols look like, but you can figure out what they're going to look like for you. And then I want you to draw a person with their back to them. So a person facing one way and idols behind them because they've turned their back and are running away from idolatry. And that's what Paul has called the Corinthian church and us to do. The latter portion of 2 Corinthians 6 starts with a quote from Isaiah about things to put off, things, and then contains some promises. God promises to dwell among to walk among, to allow us to be his people. He promises relationship and adoption as in Romans 8. So they should separate from sin, not from sinners. Listen, sin's not like COVID. You don't get it from proximity to sinners. You get it from distance from God. You don't get sin because you're around sinners. You get it when you wander from the presence of God and keep him and don't put him on the rightful throne of first place in your life. Sin is not caught by proximity to sinners but distance from God. Jesus was described in Hebrews as holy, undefiled, and sinless, and yet in the Gospels we find that he is a friend of sinners. We can be that too, holy and yet around sinners. Sin isn't like COVID caught from people around you that have it. It's caught as our own desires, according to James 1, are activated internally, resulting in external sinful actions or allowing sin to remain in our attitudes and our hearts and minds. The promises of verse 16 through 18 are about dwelling among them, being present, welcome, being treated as sons and daughters. But they're to call them, in light of these promises, to pursue holiness, a body, what we do on the outside, and spirit, what dwells within. We should not be content with cleaning up external other sins that people see, but allowing the sins of the heart to remain unchecked. God cares about the sins that dwell in our heart and our head and those done by our hands. So don't play with sin. Don't do sin management. Remember, boys and girls, I didn't have you managing sin. I had you obliterating sin, destroying sin. We're not going to do sin management 101 in the church. We do putting to death sin in the church because that's what Christ died for to put to death sin how do we do it by fearing God more than ever before by walking according to the power of the spirit in us and according to our identity in Christ he has also given us brothers and sisters that can walk with us and help us let's put to death sin by the power of Christ in us let's care enough as a church body about our corporate identity and who we are as the temple of God, First Baptist Church of Springfield, that we address the problems within our walls. Let's not do the American thing and call sin an individual's problem and only that person's problem. And as if it's only a problem between them and the Lord. No, let's help each other out. Let's take God's plan for the holiness and beauty of his bride, the local church, seriously. but let's do so from the position of grace. We show grace to each other as we model God's grace given to us. We don't look at somebody and say, Pastor, I saw you having a bad attitude. Well, go get us a new one. No. Pastor, I saw you having a bad attitude that didn't really represent the Lord very well. Don't think that's what Jesus died and created you in Christ to be. Let me call you back to holiness, Pastor. Let me do so from a position of grace. Remember, we're in this series on putting courage into each other. 
We're to put courage into the sinning saint by reminding them of God's cleansing promises. Hebrews chapter 10, 22 had said this, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is the New Testament fulfillment of the promises of God in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 through 27, that God will sprinkle them with clean water. They will be clean. He will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh that they would be careful to keep God's laws. The promises of God that you get in salvation is cleansing, forgiveness from sin, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And we know that the death of Christ in our place paid for all our sins. Jesus paid it all. Not some to him we owe, all to him we owe. So whatever you may be struggling with, if you're a Christian, cling to the promises of God. And then... Act like the new creation you are, according to the power of the Holy Spirit. Cling to God's promises about being washed and created anew and live that out. And if you're helping out a brother or sister in Christ, remind them of God's beautiful promises and grace shown to yourself and his patience in your life too. As we conclude, the band's going to come up. They're going to play something quiet, softly, and the words of Psalm 139 are going to pop up onto the screen. I want you to look at this text. Go ahead and get that up for me, if you will. Psalm 139, 23, and 24. They're going to play just quietly for a minute. Then they'll transition into us a song of response. But as they do, remember the problem is within. You don't need to be saying, God, search my wife's heart and find her sin. God, search that person on the other side of the room's heart and know their heart and know their thoughts and help them with their problems. No, Take the next minute or so to pray these words from Psalm 139. God, search my heart and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any grieving way and lead me in the way of the everlasting. God, remind me of your beautiful promises that I might bring holiness to completion out of fear of you. Appropriate reverence for the one who gave himself for us. Let's deal with the security threat from within. And let's have the courage to lean into his grace. I or my wife can talk or pray with you. We're going to both be available in the back throughout this song.
I want to draw your attention to mainly two of the announcements on the back of the bulletin. First one is that the new to FPC Springfield lunch is postponed. Uh, so you can see the new day for that will be 1023. And then also, we're having a whole lot of fun on our Wednesday night activities. And um, if you want to come for dinner prior, we have that available. Uh, so make sure to sign up. Uh, we have a sign up in the back in the foyer, or you can sign up with this code that you can see on the back of the bulletin here or from online as well. So if you forget to sign up, I encourage you to still come and continue to participate with us with the Growth Institute. Uh, if you're not available to join us with the Growth Institute on Wednesday nights, uh, we do have them available online as well. We're recording them and we're putting everything up on our website, just so you're aware of that. Uh, as we close out, I want to read uh, from Colossians 3. Uh, so I'll read a passage and I'll close this out in prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Colossians 3 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. For Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you, Lord, as broken sinners. Lord, we thank you that you have saved us by your grace. Lord, as we uh, continue the process of looking more like your son, Lord, the process of sanctification as we carry on this Christian life, Lord, I pray that we recognize that our call to holiness is not a legalistic call, Lord, that we recognize that we can't do this at all on our own. And we're not doing it to try to earn your approval. Lord, you have saved us and given us your Son and given us your Holy Spirit and now have given us the ability to become more like you. Lord, as we pursue holiness, Lord, I pray that we do it out of our devotion for you, our love for you, Lord, out of our worship to you, so that when others look at us, they could see you in us, Lord, that it's not about ourselves, but it's about the work that you are doing. Lord, I pray that we can truly be your hands and your feet, Lord, being your body here in this wor world, doing your work, and representing you well, Lord. I pray these things in your name. Amen.